people in the entire country convicted of cyber stalking resulting in death. J5 over the courthouse in the moment the courthouse we got shots fired here. 10 4 J85. First and foremost, this was not a random act of violence. We're in the courthouse. In the top lobby. Um, I don't know what the status is yet. Shots have been fired inside a Wilmington, Delaware courthouse. In the lobby, I got two additional subject down. Witnesses say a man shot and killed two women. Our next two more stuff on shooters down. Shooters down. We are now getting word that the gunman may be dead. The FBI is on site in Secret Service. A uh, shooting occurred. Ever encountered the unsettling video labeled don't Hurt Me Mommy on YouTube from March 20th, 2011. The account holder was subsequently arrested and sentenced to life imprisonment. Well, why don't you focus on the lady in the footage? Take a look. Now, the lady you're seeing in the footage is Christine Belford, a woman whose life takes a chilling turn in the perplexing saga known as the disturbing secret behind Don't Hurt Me Mommy, the case of Christine Belford. The footage circulating online paints a grim picture, suggesting child mistreatment, yet the uproar in the comments hints at a deeper, more ominous tale. Fast forward to 2007, which was a year etched in horror for Christine. The stage is set, and David Matisiewicz, Christine's ex-husband, emerges as a key player. On August 26, 2007, Christine reluctantly lets David take their children for what he promises to be a joyful trip to Disney World. But little does she know, this sets in motion a nightmare that will grip the nation. Two weeks pass, and the unthinkable happens. The children vanish without a trace, and David is nowhere to be found. What unfolds next is an intense 18-month international manhunt that would reveal a web of deceit and malevolence. David, along with his mother Lenore, father Thomas and sister Amy, orchestrate a cyberstalking campaign of unprecedented magnitude. This family would go on to perpetrate the worst case of cyberstalking in the state's history, a heinous act that ultimately results in a conviction for the first ever case of cyberstalking resulting in death. J85, I'm in the courthouse, in the moment the courthouse, we got shots fired here. 10 4 J85. First and foremost, this was not a random act of violence. We're in the courthouse. In the top lobby. Um, I don't know what the status is yet. Shots have been fired inside a Wilmington, Delaware courthouse. In the lobby, I got two additional subjects down. Witnesses say a man shot and killed two women. Our next two more stuff on shooters down. Shooters down. We are now getting word that the gunman may be dead. The FBI is on site in the Secret Service. Uh, a shooting occurred at about 8 o'clock this morning. Let's dive more into the story. Now, on February 11th, 2013, a harrowing incident unfolded within the walls of the Wilmington Courthouse, forever altering the lives of those involved. An unidentified man, fueled by malevolence, opened fire, claiming the lives of two women before taking his own and a tragic culmination of violence and despair. As the aftermath unfolded, law enforcement grappled with the preliminary stages of the investigation, navigating through the eerie corridors of the crime scene. Tactical teams combed every floor of the courthouse, attempting to piece together the puzzle left in the wake of the inexplicable bloodshed. The unsettling revelations continued as the gunman's white SUV was discovered parked across the street, harboring a chilling secret within its confines. Inside, a red notebook surfaced, exposing a sinister hit list of intended victims. Among the names etched in ominous detail was that of Timothy Hitchings, a man intricately linked to Christine Belford, a key figure in a convoluted narrative. Timothy Hitchings, Christine Belford's lawyer, found himself entangled in a web of terror, realizing he was a target marked for a sinister fate. He said that he was intended to be killed that day, grappling with the gravity of the impending danger that lurked around him. The CCTV footage was a silent witness to the unfolding tragedy, unveiling two figures exiting the vehicle, with one nonchalantly crossing the street to infiltrate the courthouse alone. At 12.10pm, the police released a statement disclosing a chilling connection. The gunman was related to one of the victims, reportedly his estranged wife. However, the narrative took a dark twist, revealing a far more disturbing truth. Detective Jeff Schreiner, the lone familiar face of the crime scene, found himself transported back to September 9, 2007, a pivotal date 
in the haunting saga. Christine Belford, distraught and desperate, had reached out to him, reporting the kidnapping of her three daughters by her ex-husband David Matusiewicz and his mother Lenora Matusiewicz. Initially dismissing it as a custody dispute, Detective Schreiner's skepticism waned as David remained elusive. Christine, armed with custody papers revealing David's machinations to brand her an unfit mother, set the investigation in motion. The credit card records became a breadcrumb trail, pointing to David's last transaction on the day he spirited the children away, a sinister departure that signaled a parent's betrayal. More than 2,000 miles away in Hidalgo, Texas, Christine's daughters, Laura, Leigh and Karen found themselves unwitting pawns in a heart-wrenching scheme. David and Lenora, devoid of remorse, steered a Winnebago towards the Mexican border, seamlessly crossing into the unknown. The gravity of David's premeditated malevolence became apparent as investigators delved into his calculated preparations. Fake IDs, international ties to New Zealand and Canada, and a meticulously planned escape highlighted the extent of the sinister plot. The unsettling truth unfolded as David, in a final act of betrayal, left Christine burdened with a fraudulent line of credit under her name. I'm sitting here in Delaware trying to figure out where they could have gone, what they could be doing, searching on the internet, doing whatever I could. She was very strong through all of this. I, I don't know how she did it. It was all with, with grace. Um, even though she hadn't slept the night before, she would go out there and try to do right by those kids. In November 2007, Christine Belford's torment escalated as her daughters remained missing for an agonizing two months. Thomas Matusiewicz and Amy Gonzalez relocated near the Mexican border and denied any knowledge deepening the mystery. Detective Jeff Schreiner, grappling with inconsistencies, speculated about the family's involvement, intensifying the intrigue. International headlines blared about the kidnapping of three girls by optometrist Dr. David Matisiewicz, intensifying the urgency. U.S. Marshals, hot on the trail, uncovered David in Kera Azul, Panama, but he cunningly eluded capture, plunging the search into a disheartening lull. March 2009 brought a glimmer of hope as the FBI traced a call to Nicaragua. A distinctive RV triggered an all-points bulletin, leading to David's arrest during a routine traffic stop. Lenora and the two youngest girls were found nearby, marking a poignant reunion for Christine. Amid the relief, a grim reality emerged. David, depleted of his million-dollar cash, resorted to selling his daughter's belongings. The reunion unearthed the insidious narratives he had fed the children, particularly Laura, who believed her mother had taken her own life. Justice unfolded as David pleaded guilty, earning a four-year prison term. Lenora faced consequences too, with an 18-month jail sentence. However, a foreboding letter from David in 2009 hinted at darker chapters ahead, setting the stage for the courthouse shooting four years later, ensuring Christine's ordeal persisted even after the partial restoration of her family. In an unexpected turn, Cindy Bander enters Christine Belford's life through a Facebook message expressing concern and claiming past involvement with David Matusiewicz. Cindy, empathizing with Christine's plight, becomes an unlikely confidant, offering a supportive space for Christine to share details about her daughters' lives. However, skepticism looms as some, like Katie, express distrust towards Cindy. The year 2009 unfolds with a malicious website surfacing titled A Grandmother's Impossible Choice, concocted by the Matusiewicz. Fabricated allegations of child abuse tarnish Christine's reputation, revealing the extent of the Matusiewicz's vengeful tactics. Amy Gonzalez, acting on David's directives from prison, spearheads a campaign to disseminate the false narrative. Mailed printouts of the website reach Christine's friends, neighbors, schools, and even her church, strategically aimed at dismantling her credibility. Despite Christine's resignation from her role as a Sunday school teacher, the Matusiewicz persist in their relentless pursuit to ruin her life. The campaign takes a toll on Christine, who valiantly shields her daughters from Matusiewicz's orchestrated terror. Katie, now 16, assumes a supportive role, assisting her mother in safeguarding the family. As Lenora Matusiewicz is released from prison in 2010, Christine grapples with a looming threat. 
Despite having a restraining order against the entire Matusiewicz family, the situation escalated in 2011 when Christine discovered a disturbing video titled Don't Hurt Me Mommy, filmed without her knowledge. The video amplifies mundane moments, portraying Christine as an aggressor and intensifying the psychological torment inflicted by the Matusiewicz. The chilling developments reinforce the ongoing nightmare Christine faces, showcasing the Matusiewicz's relentless determination to wreak havoc on her life. With a sinister agenda, the Matusiewicz's intensify their psychological warfare on Christine Belford, aiming to portray her as an abusive mother. In December 2011, Lenore and Thomas, undebted by a restraining order, appeared unannounced at Christine's door, leaving her and her daughters traumatized. Fearful for their safety, Christine fortifies her home with cameras, guard dogs, bats, and knives. As Christine plans to relocate, Cindy, a supposed ally, covertly collaborates with David's sister Amy and relays sensitive information. Cindy's email exchange becomes a conduit for the Matusiewiczs to learn about Christine's moving plans. Unbeknownst to Christine, a sinister plot unfolds as the Matusiewiczs meticulously document her residence, anticipating a home invasion upon David's impending release from prison. Despite Christine's growing anxiety, she remains unaware of the impending danger. Cindy's betrayal escalates when it's revealed she maintains a sexual relationship with David through email exchanges, facilitating the Matusiewicz's access to crucial information. The Matusiewicz's, armed with knowledge obtained through Cindy, intensify their campaign, culminating in a chilling plan for a home invasion. Christine, fearing the worst, prepares her eldest daughter, Katie, for an emergency escape plan. On April 13, 2012, David's release marks a sinister turning point. As Christine attends a routine child support hearing, tragedy strikes. In the Newcastle County Courthouse, Thomas Matusiewicz shoots Christine, her friend Beth Mulford, and two security guards. Thomas, the assailant, ultimately takes his own life. The aftermath reveals the extent of the Matusiewicz's elaborate scheme involving false allegations and cyber-stalking leading to murder. In their defense, they persist with claims of Christine's alleged abuse, despite overwhelming evidence refuting their narrative. The trial, commencing in June 2015, became a landmark case of cyber-stalking resulting in murder. Despite the Matusiewicz's stoic demeanor, the prosecution presents irrefutable evidence, including thousands of pieces collected by the FBI, highlighting their meticulous planning. Katie, now 20, courageously testifies against them. Laura, Christine's youngest daughter, pivotal to the case, unequivocally refutes the fabricated abuse claims unraveling the Matusiewicz's lies. In the end, the trial concludes with guilty verdicts for David, Lenore, and Amy, each sentenced to life without parole. Christine Belford's fight endures through her daughter's resilience, culminating in justice for a mother whose legacy transcends the heinous acts inflicted upon her. The Matusiewicz's attempt to erase her spirit fails as Christine's memory lives on through the strength of her four daughters. Anyways, in the end, what do you guys think? Do drop your thoughts in the comment section below and we'll meet in the next episode.